Hello, uh, welcome. Um, th this is an allergy man. Uh, my name is John Items, and about a year ago, I did a presentation because I was concerned about my country and the state it's in. And uh, all I did is I took a whole lot of McLean's magazine front covers and pulled them together. What I noticed, and uh, I'll go through some of them with you, is that uh, every cover had some kind of, a, kind of a problem. For instance, look at this one. Inside the dangerously empty lives of teenage girls. The new underclass. And they were talking about the fact that a lot of uh, people are graduating from university and can't get jobs. Another one was the broken generation talking about our young people. Uh, another one is the Great Recession, part two. Now, all these things need to be brought up to date, but that was the state about two years ago. And then there's this one, inside the great real estate crash of 2013. Now, I don't know, did we have a real estate crash in 2013? If we didn't, the news is we're going to have one shortly. I'm just saying that with all the bad news that we get, no wonder we're kind of a little depressed and it's kind of odd that in Canada that we would have that kind of thing going on. Um, I used to, when I was a boy, I'm an immigrant, came here when I was five years old. We used to sing every day, O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love and all thy sons command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land glorious and free. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. You can't sing that every day, you know, for a lifetime and not believe what what it is. And um, what's amazing to me is, is um, I used to mean every word of it when I was a boy. And I think most of us do when we sing that song, O Canada. But what's, what's odd is, is when we get to the line, God keep our land glorious and free, there are elements now in our country where they're going to try to take those words out of that. And so I want to talk about this. This is very important. Is God keeping our land or isn't he? Are we going to stand on guard for it or not? Well, that's what the title of this message is going to be. The true nor strong and free. Where does freedom come from anyway? Another thing I remember doing when I was a boy is every, um, every November uh, we had um, uh, Remembrance Day. And I remember we were told to repeat and I remember memorizing in Flanders Fields and when I got to the line that says take up our quarrel with the foe to you with failing hands we flow th throw the torch be yours to lift it high if you break faith with us who die we shall not sleep though poppies blow in Flanders Fields I used to wonder what do you mean take up our quarrel with the foe um that's odd, but um, I was born in Germany, and I guess, what, 50 years ago, I was the foe. But now I'm a Canadian, and I'm proud to be a Canadian. And, and the, the foe is no longer the Japanese or, or the Germans, but there's still an ancient foe. And that reminds me of a line that I heard in an old hymn called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It says, And still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His strength and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. And I think what we've forgotten in Canada, we've forgotten our Christian roots and the fact that we have an enemy and that enemy is not dead yet. Uh, there's still enemies of mankind and we need to be reminded of that. Uh, then um, I went to the States for my education and I went to Tennessee Temple University and they would stand up and they would uh, sing their national anthem and, and occasionally we'd repeat some of the lines. And this one really, really uh, touched my heart. Uh, it's the inscription at the foot of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Statue of Liberty it was written in 1888. It says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Uh, always touched me. And uh, recently I saw this photo taken in Syria with the refugees in a bombed out city. And I realized that although I live in a free country, that most of the people in this world do not live in a free country. And, and, and there's something we need to do about that. 
Where does freedom come from anyway? While we live in the free world, the rest of the world is not free. Uh, Dr. Francis Schaeffer, and he's been dead since 1984, he did a series called How Should We Then Live? And uh, uh, I think all of us should watch some of this material, and I'm going to try to condense his words very quickly during this presentation. Um, but in 1982, this is what he said. A fairly recent poll of the 150-some countries that now constitute the world shows that only 25 of these countries have any freedoms at all. That means that we are, we here in what we call the free world, we're really quite unique. What's the definition of freedom? Here's some definitions of freedom. The state of not being under another person's control, not a captive or a slave. The power to do and say and think as one pleases without reprisal. Exemption or release from unfavorable or undesirable conditions. To live without constant want, fear, anxiety, uncertainty, and unhappiness. And I have to tell you that as a Canadian, I have, I have lived in freedom for all of my life. And yet most of the world does not live in freedom. Where does freedom come from? Where does it come from? It comes from people living and working together in harmony, meeting each other's needs, planning and building an orderly, safe, sustainable community free from wants and suffering and fear. It requires that people in the community are all willing to live by the same rules, even if the rules limit some of their freedoms. Freedom without limits. Some people believe that having limits on freedom is a contradiction. Some believe that there should be absolute freedom, that they should be free to do anything they want. And that's what I'm hearing all the time in my culture. I want freedom. It's just... But just because we have free will, the ability to choose and do anything we want to do, well, listen, we're prone to make mistakes and we shouldn't all have free, complete freedom. Not all choices are right or good. So what makes a choice uh, right or wrong? A choice must be in harmony with design to be right or good. And I'll talk more about that later, but you just got to hear me out. A choice must be in harmony with design to be right or good. A choice that is in conflict with design is wrong or bad. And a choice that is deliberately wrong is evil. Uh, if you feed a baby bottle and you fill it with antifreeze, that means you're giving something in court that's against design. If you pour sand in the gas tank, that's doing something against design. Matter of fact, everything that we do every day of our life Almost everything that we do, we do it according to design. And whenever we do something against design, that's called, the Bible calls it sin. That's called wickedness and evil. Now, absolute freedom in the natural world would mean chaos. I think we've got, what, 94 elements? That There were 94 elements when I was a boy, which means that all of matter in the universe was divided into at least 94 different kinds. And that's what makes the universe work because each element stays itself. It, uh, and if each element had the freedom to be like all the other elements, you wouldn't even have a universe. Absolute freedom in the natural world would mean chaos. And absolute freedom in the civilized world would mean anarchy. And this is what we're beginning to see in Europe and across the Middle East. And we're even hearing it in the, uh, the American cities and not so much in Canada, but people are suggesting absolute freedom, which is anarchy. So what makes choices or actions either good or evil? Wise actions bring beneficial results. Unwise actions bring harmful results. Most sensible of people agree that beneficial results are good and harmful results are bad. Sensible means showing good judgment. Um, a sensible person uses his or her freedom to choose wisely, choose the actions that bring good and not bad. And actually common sense is a universal agreement among all individual that there's gotta be a set of rules of what's right and wrong. For instance, acting in ignorance is bad. Ignoring problems or danger is bad. Avoiding personal responsibility is bad. Delaying or deferring duties is bad. Carelessness is bad. 
Recklessness is bad. Harmful, destructive behavior is bad. Self-indulgence at another expense is bad. And you say, uh, we don't want to hear the word bad. You have to have the word bad to be able to define the word good. So just in review, right is anything done in harmony with design. And wrong is anything done contrary to design. Here's a little known Bible fact. The Bible actually states that the purpose of government is to reward and encourage good and to discourage and punish evil. I can actually quote the verse, um, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God, and we're talking about government, to thee for good. But if thou do that which be evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's Romans 13, 3 and 4. And those are the verses that give all governments their mandate to rule. Here's a dictionary definition of law. A rule or regulation made by a country or a state for the benefit of all the people who live there. The purpose of law is to encourage good and to discourage evil. Good societies have always written laws to promote good and discourage evil. One example, and uh, uh, this will be on your screen, this is the Stele of Hammurabi. Uh, archaeologists found this stone pillar in 1901 in Iran. This pillar was carved in 1700 BC, 30, what, 500 years ago, more than 3,500 years old, and it's now about 3,700 years old. It was carved in the reign of Hammurabi, who was the sixth king of Babylonia. It is inscribed from top to bottom with the Babylonian Code of Law. The code consists of 282 laws. On the top of the stele, uh, it depicts Hammurabi on the left. He's standing. He's the king. And he's receiving the law from Shamash, the sun god who is sitting on, it on the right. Notice this example of one of the earliest law codes implied that human law had to have a divine origin to be fair and equitable. This is so no accident. Their god was an idol, but the concept of divine origin was accurate. When you compare the law codes of all the ancient civilizations, like the Egyptian, Babylonian, Chinese, Greek, etc., you discover that there are some certain striking characteristics. Number one, all these places invariably attributed their laws to coming from a divine origin. Number two, they had very clear definitions of what was right and wrong, and they all seemed to indicate that they had a conscience. The existence of a conscience is a universal phenomenon. Um, let me quote another passage out of Romans. It says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witnesses. What this means is, this old Bible text says that even folks who have no written laws tend to agree on what's right and wrong It's the most, as if it's the most natural thing in the world, something that we all share. Since we all share a conscience, that explains why throughout history there's been general agreement on what's right and wrong. And it also explains the similarities in the law codes of all civilized countries. What does it mean to be civilized? Civilized, showing culture and good manners, refined. To civilize, to change from being savage and ignorant to having good laws and customs and knowledge of the arts and sciences. So one similarity among all advanced civilizations is they had good laws. When these laws are compared, the obvious question becomes, could there be such a thing as a universal law code? From a Christian perspective, the idea of a universal code makes sense. After all, if there is a creator... He would also be the designer, not just of the physical universe, but also of civilizations. Is there any evidence of the designer's influence in human history? Is there any evidence of a universal law code? The best laws are those which would come from the creator. 
So is there any evidence that some of man's laws actually came from the Creator? When all of men's laws are boiled down to their common denominator, an amazing phenomenon is uncovered. The Jewish Ten Commandments, given as, as they supposedly claim, from the hand of the Creator Himself, were a remarkable summary of all the best laws of even the pagan civilizations of those days. It's almost as if a universal law code had been given at the beginning of human civilization back in Mesopotamia, and that code was passed down from generation to generation until the Jewish people got a law from Mount Sinai. And when they compared to all the stuff that had been passed down to the law from Mount Sinai, they said, hey, now we know which are the good laws and which are the bad laws. The Code of Hammurabi was not the same as the Law of Moses. The Code of Hammurabi was given in 1700 BC. The Law of Moses was given in 1450 BC. But you know what? When you compare the two, the principles of rewarding good and punishing evil was the same. The similarities of pagan law codes to the Ten Commandments suggest that ultimately for all time and all cultures and all civilizations, there must have been and there must still be a universal code. Where would a universal code have come from? A couple of years ago, we put together this chart with some help, and I'm going to make a suggestion. Have a look at this chart. This chart begins with the flood of Noah, which nobody in our culture believes in anymore, but the Bible teaches there was a flood. Well, before the flood, there was a man called Adam, and if you look on the chart to the left, the blue line is Adam. Adam, we think, we're pretty sure that Adam got all of God's laws. And I think he tried to pass those laws on to his kids. Uh, he passed them on to Abel. But unfortunately, Abel was killed by his brother Cain, who didn't trust God's laws. And his brother Cain not only killed Abel, but began to pass on some man-made laws to his children. And if you look, Cain's people departed from all the law of Adam and Eve. And as a result, God sent the judgment in the flood. Everybody died except eight people that made it through the flood. And one of them was Noah. And Noah brought the law of God back into the new world after the flood. And it, it, that's represented by that long green line. And Noah passed those laws on to his children. Matter of fact, the Jewish people still call those laws the Noahide laws. And you ought to look that up in, on, the, on the internet. Anyway, uh, the people that survived the flood and that, that or, or, or not, I, I can't say that. Noah's children, uh, 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 all the people on the earth came from Noah's children. And at the Tower of Babel, they all began to speak different languages. And so they took Noah's law and they translated it into different languages and they made, like usual, a whole lot of mistakes. And that's what those uh, twisted purple lines are. They didn't pass on God's law they passed on God's law mixed with man's law. And so the next line is, is there's God's law mixed in with man's law. And after all, you couldn't tell which is God's law and which is man's law. And so God sent Moses uh, the law on Mount Sinai. And, and so in 1450 BC, they were able to tell which were men's laws and which were God's laws. And so they were able to get rid of the man's laws, which were corrupt, and they started practicing God's laws, and it was wonderful. But once again, as usual, even the Jewish people didn't follow the law very well, and they began to corrupt God's law, and they mixed man's law in with God's law. And so we were lost again in a mix-up. And so guess what God did? God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ reestablished this law. As a matter of fact, he not only reestablished the law, but he paid the penalty for all those broken laws from the time that he from the time of history to the end of history. We'll get more into that later. So, what's the universal law? Here's a bit of history. From the dawn of civilization, all groups of men have made their own laws. These laws were practiced until the time of Moses, when Moses gave the 10 commandments. There were already many law codes in the world. The Ten Commandments became the yardstick by which all of these other codes of law were measured. The verdict is now in. 
there have been no codes of law in human history more fair and equitable than the Ten Commandments. Um, there's a website you can go to that you can find out what each of these Ten Commandments mean and how they should apply in your life, so I won't go into detail here. What's amazing is, and this is astounding, those Ten Commandments can be further reduced to two commandments. Jesus was asked, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto this man, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If every human being on the face of this earth simply followed those two laws, we wouldn't have war, we wouldn't have want, we wouldn't have prisons. What's more amazing than this? That those two laws can be reduced down to one. That's why we know that these laws come from God. Only God's laws would be so universal as this. What's the one law? That one law is, Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. There's only one law. It's a universal law. Matter of fact, it's, it'll be the law of the universe if we ever get off this planet. And this one law is called, in secular words, the golden rule. Amazingly, even atheists tend to agree with the golden rule. You ask them, what's your ethic? Oh, I believe in the golden rule. That's because the golden rule is the universal basis of all civilization. Now, you're going to have to study this out for yourself, but check it out. Here's an interesting inside light. The mathematician John Nash won the Nobel Prize for mathematically proving the golden rule. And uh, I'll give you this link. You can look it up for yourself. It's a scene from the film, A Beautiful Mind. I think you should watch it. The mathematician John Nash, played by Russell Crowe, has an epiphany which overturns Adam Smith's theory of economics. That's an incredibly good scene. So um, go and uh, follow up and check this one out. I can't, there's not time to watch it together. All I'm saying is, is the golden rule was even proved mathematically to be true. It is the universal law. All enduring civilizations, the ones that endured, had fair and equitable laws. And each progressive civilization borrowed from the successes of the last one. Our Canadian society got its law from an existing civilization. America and Canada derived their codes of law from Britain, and Britain from the Ten Commandments. It's because of these roots that countries like Canada and America are dubbed the free world. Ultimately, freedom comes from the law of God. The writers of our national uh, anthem understood this in our national constitution. When Canada became a country 135 years ago, was it 135 years ago? I've forgotten. Do the math. <laughs> and recently, as 50 years ago, when many of our grandparents and parents immigrated, they moved to a country where the Lord's Day was still honored and where the Ten Commandments were still the basis for the morality of our neighbors. And all that has changed. I was in Penetanguishing in 1999 with that atheist, I think his name was George Freitag, came into the legislature there, legislature there and demanded that they get rid of uh, saying the Lord's Prayer before every meeting. And you know what? There wasn't a Christian in the room that stood up against this man. And as a result, they got rid of it. And as a matter of fact, almost all legislatures across Canada, they've gotten rid of saying the, uh, the Lord's Prayer and then they're moving to get rid of the Ten Commandments. And there's movements afoot right now to take the word God out of our national anthem. The law... The universal law is almost completely ignored. Um, here's a funny little cartoon um, called Zitz. And uh, uh, the mother's overlooking her son who's stressing out over his computer, studying, cramming for exams. And she says, uh, um, you would have less stress 
if you didn't put things off until the last minute. And he says, according to who? Um, according to almost everyone throughout history. <laughs> and he says, and I'm supposed to believe them? What's happened in our country is, is people no longer respect uh, the wisdom of the last generation. Uh, our young man in this cartoon is voicing what is our greatest cultural problem. He's casting his own judgment as equal to the judgment of everybody else in history. Young people are being taught to do this in school. They are told there's no absolute truths, no moral absolutes. All the truth and morality is relative to the circumstances and the interpretation of the individual. Whatever you believe is true and right is true and right for you, but it's not necessarily true and right for me. This philosophy is known as moral and intellectual relativism. Christians call it moral bankruptcy. And that's what's being taught in our nation. It's the moral code of atheism. Without a creator, of course, there can be no universal lawgiver. Every person is free to make their own law. Militant atheists have admitted this for years. And the results have been devastating. Of course, they try to cover up. I think of the testimony of Jeffrey Dahmer. He was a, a serial killer. Here's what he said. If a person doesn't think there is a God to be accountable to, then, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came up from the slime. When we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. No wonder he was a serial killer. He had no morality whatsoever. Um, I have several other testimonies, including my own, that will will mount on the website. But for now, let me just remind you. Occasionally, a free country needs to be reminded of what they knew several generations ago. All humanly derived laws and rules, if they are fair and equitable, must have originated with the Creator. Canada's roots also go back to this belief. Here's some of the uh, clues of Canada's Christian heritage, which we seem to have forgotten. Mr. Prime Minister, my first words are a prayer. This is George Vanier, who was the Governor General of Canada. My first words are a prayer. May Almighty God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, bless the sacred mission which has been entrusted to me by Her Majesty the Queen, and help me to fulfill it in all humility. In exchange for his strength, I offer him my weakness. May he give peace to this beloved land of ours and to those who live in it by grace of mutual understanding, respect, and love. One of the products of our Christian heritage was Sir Samuel Leonard Tilly. He was the premier of uh, New Brunswick at the time of Confederation, and he was a father of Confederation. His direct contribution to Canada's tradition is truly national in scope. From Tilly came both Canada's official motto and the country's unique title, the Dominion of Canada. Both the term Dominion and the motto, Amari Yusk Admar, are taken from Psalm 72, verse 8. He, which is God, shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. We took our national motto from the Bible. Here's an excerpt from a speech given by Francis Schaeffer two years before he died. He went on tour and spoke this in all the churches. He said, and I'm going to quote it in detail, You forget that the freedoms which we have in Northern Europe after the Reformation, and the United States is an extension of that, as would be Australia and Canada and New Zealand, etc., these freedoms are absolutely unique in the world. Occasionally, some of you have gone to universities, have been taught that these freedoms are rooted in the Greek city-states. That is not the truth. All you have to do is read Plato's Republic, and you understand that the Greek city-states never had any concept of the freedoms that we have. Go back into history. The freedoms which we have, the form and freedom balance of government, are unique in history, and they are also unique in the world 
at this day. A fairly recent poll of some 150, I quoted this earlier, of countries that now constitute the world shows that only 25 of these countries have any freedom at all. This was, uh, he was quoting in 1982. So there's more countries. What we have, this is Schaefer speaking, and we take so poorly for granted, is unique. It was brought forth by a specific worldview, and that specific worldview was the Judeo-Christian worldview, especially as it was refined in the Reformation, putting the authority indeed at a central point, not in the church and the state and the word of God, but rather in the word of God alone. All the benefits which we, which we know, I would repeat, which we have taken so easily and so much for granted, are unique. This is Dr. Francis Schaeffer and what he said in 1976. I will end with this. When a nation is under the rule of God and the individuals are under the rule of God, they, they are willing to sacrifice their ultimate or absolute freedom and, and narrow them down towards freedoms that are kind of refined. But when people no longer under the, the, the law of God, they want absolute freedom. And when people get absolute freedom, that is the destruction of the nation. Um, many years ago, a man called Teitler made a graph. He studied history. And you know how we all say the only thing we've ever learned from history is that we learn nothing from history? Well, he learned this from history. It's called the life cycle of nations. I'm going to end with this. Notice that the life cycle of, uh, of history starts at 12 o'clock midnight, which is bondage. And it starts clockwise. A nation always starts with spiritual faith in which they get their laws from the creator. Spiritual faith gives them the courage to build a country from scratch. That courage and the building sets them free. They have what's called liberty. Liberty brings abundance. And when I was a boy, Canada had such incredible, incredible promise, and such freedom and such abundance. And when a, when a nation gets abundance, the next step is selfishness, where people become selfish. And selfish is the turn, selfishness is the turning point of a nation. When people become selfish, they become complacent. When they become complacent, they become apathetic. When they become apathetic, they become dependent. And after they're dependent, they wind up back in bondage. Ladies and gentlemen, we are headed for bondage. We have given up the law of God. We've given every man the right to do whatever's right in their own eyes. Anyone can do whatever they feel like. We, are, we have crossed the line. And our, and our nation is it's due for destruction from within. It's rotten from within. Can it be saved? Certainly it can be saved. The great news is this, that at the end of the cycle of history, God saw the mess that we gotten ourselves into and he said someone has to pay for the sin of this world. And so he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, never sinned once, never did anything wrong, was accused, wrongly accused, given a mock trial and was crucified and hung on a cross. When he died on that cross, his death paid the sin debt of the world from Adam all the way to the end of the age until the last Adam. That means that everything we've ever done wrong was paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. But there's a problem. He's paid for it in advance, but you have got to apply. You have got to come to God and say, I'm a sinner I've done wrong. I need my sins paid for. Please forgive me my sins and save my soul. Now that's the gospel. And you've all heard this a thousand times from a thousand different places. 
The only reason why you've never taken it seriously and the reason some of you have prayed an empty prayer is because you forgot the perspective of the law. You must understand that you must put yourself under the law of God. You've got to be willing to say, I want to obey the law of God. Because when you begin to see that you want to obey the law of God, you begin to see what a great sinner you are. And only when you see what a great sinner you are can you see what a great salvation that the Lord offers. So if you're listening to the sound of my voice and you're no longer any, under any kind of law, you ought to get under the law of God and you ought to admit that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. Can our nation be saved? Yes. One person at a time, starting with you. Mm -hmm.